Welcome, Jaja. Welcome, Faustin. Everyone give them a round of applause. Uh, my name is Jaja Swinton. Um, and my art, uh, this project is titled uh, Beauty for Ashes. Um, I've been work working on it roughly about four years off and on now. Um, and it's finally at a place where I'm ready to finish it. And just to kind of give you guys um, a brief rundown of what it's about. Um, it really deals with an extended season of trauma and mourning uh, that I was going through um, as a result of uh, the ending of my marriage, okay? And essentially a reframing and a complete restructuring of my family life um, through the family court system. And so um, this was my way of trying to process um, the implosion, essentially, of my, my entire life and my world in a very short time and what life moving forward would look like and um, what it meant to, um, to mourn and to grieve um, what was lost. Uh, and so that's, that's um, in terms of the, the, the theme of the work, that's what I'm dealing with. So mourning, recording for my kids, um, a way for them to be able to kind of see what the experience is like in, in a, a conversation that uh, them and I would have um, as they got older and they asked more questions about that and also a way to look forward and to vision cast for the future and, and what life can look like for us in spite of you know what happened um, and that it can still be beautiful can still be amazing um, and so that's that's really what I'm working with uh, in terms of the technicalities of the work itself um, I've always been really interested in um, the use of light and color uh, in, in artwork and in painting. Um, it's always cap uh, captivated me and so I wanted to play around with the, the idea of the passage of time in the way that I uh, set up my color palette and the way that I arranged the values of the painting itself um, to show that this wasn't a quick this wasn't a quick process, you know, I don't, I don't know if anybody here has ever lost anyone or gone through a divorce or of any kind, but um, grief is, is, not a, is not a quick thing that you just kind of run through, you know, it, there's stages to it. And sometimes when you feel like you're over it, you know, something else happens and you get a new wave and it's like, oh my God, I thought I was over this. Um, and so I wanted to kind of play around with that idea um, in the way that I use color, in the way that I use uh, the materials. Um, another, another thing that um, is kind of really um, specific to this series is that I have actually incorporated um, court documents from my divorce, um, redacted, um, and also my parents' divorce because in the process of going through my own, um, a lot of like long buried memories and, and feelings of the past started coming up. And um, it was almost kind of like, you know, having that, that worst case scenario in your life, you're like, man, I don't, if this ever happened, I don't know what I would do, and then it happened. And so it was like, it happened for me. And I had to figure out like, how do I move forward? You know, how do I deal with this? Um, this thing that I never wanted to happen, this worst fear, now it's here, now I'm living it. Um, so this was, this is how I did it. I incorporated um, acrylic transfers of the court documents and uh, I've actually burned quite a number of them and incorporated them into the paint itself. So physically, they are part of the image um, as well as being seen visibly. They're physically a part of the image. You can't separate um, these things that have disrupted my life from the images themselves. And so kind of in a nutshell, that's, that's what it is. I, thank you guys for having me here. I'm really excited to be here and talking and I'm gonna pass this on. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Faustina Deniran. Uh, I am an artist, of course, you know, as we can see. So I started making art since I was very young, from as far back as I could remember, four. And um, art has always been my own escapist. Uh, living through different families. And so uh, the works I have here is part of a series called Society. Uh, Society series was my transition into the US uh, from Nigeria. And uh, coming from a very bustling 
uh, community in Lagos and then uh, coming to the US and seeing New York just like this image here, this piece here and then making the comparison of where I come from and where I now decide to have as my new home. And so Society Series was um, really a piece, uh, a series that really got me connected to the United States because I was very, uh, I was very much observant about what type of materials that I could use to create a reflection of my own community. And I realized that cans is so much in abundance in the United States. And the aspect of having cans being used by everyone, you know, regardless of their, you know, identity, uh, their status, the rich use cans, the poor use cans, the homeless use cans. We all drink out of these objects. And so the best way for me to be able to bring this community together that is so separated is by using all these cans that we all use and create these beautiful pieces with it, right? So when you're looking at this piece, you're not just looking at Coca-Cola or Fanta or Sprite. No, you are looking at individual person because we all touch these cans. It's crazy. And so, uh, Reflection started, uh, Reflection is a new series that I started working on after spending a decade in the United States. Now I'm reflecting back with the type of materials and a type of art that I have made. And so I'm very happy to bring these pieces for you to see and also for us to have like all an open mind for conversation and also to learn together. Thank you for coming. This is, um, I have so many questions. Oh, but, oh, by the way, in terms of questions, um, if write down the questions you have. I'm sure some of you already have questions. Write down the questions you have, and we're gonna have a question and answer portion. Um, we only have one hour with these amazing artists, but um, write them down. Um, I just wanted to, I, I had questions, and now what you just said is making me delete them, because um, <laughs> I, I, one of the questions I wanted to ask um, is, I, I'm, I'm trying to avoid this question, so I'm gonna put it as a placeholder. You don't have to answer it right now. Um, because neither of you have brought up the idea of race in your work, mm. you as black men. Mm -hmm. And we don't have to talk about that right now. Um, but I want to put a placeholder in that because it's so easy, um, at, even at, at, a, at an institution like this one or when you're in predominantly white spaces, I do this often, is this almost like this reminder, because I'm constantly reminded of, the flat, uh, of my blackness, of my black maleness, right? And, um, but you guys just introduced your works without talking about that at all. It had nothing to, it's not the, it's not the primary thing in your work um, based on your conversation. And I wanted to know how, how, if at all, that plays a role in how you create or your process for this project or for other ones. Because I'm sure there's something to, it has something to do with it, but it wasn't part of your formal introduction to your work. And I find that surprising, um, but I also find it refreshing. Yeah, uh, well, I, I personally, I'll say, um, like you said, uh, we don't really have the luxury of forgetting who and what we are. Like, society never lets us forget that. And um, even though I didn't talk about it in my introduction, um, it is very much a part of why I've done what I've done, specifically because, um, especially when you're, you know, when you're dealing with court, you're dealing with any kind of court, but especially family court, there are a certain set of assumptions um, that are already at play 
when you when you go before the, the judge, right? So um, it's quite often remarked that there is um, a dearth of of fatherhood and fathers who are present in black communities. Um, and I like to submit that to a large degree, um, that is untrue. Um, maybe not present in the ways that you think that we are, but we are present. Um, the challenge for us is that because we are black and we are male, and there is this, this um, story that has been perpetuated that we're not involved, that we don't care, it is infinitely harder for us to actually be involved in our children's lives in ways that matter without without it just being a, a well how much can you provide you know how how much can you pay this month but i'm working so hard and i'm making so little so that i can pay child support so that i can i can do what i need to do by my kids i can't even come visit them mm. i can't i don't even have time to go visit them because i work 16 hour days four or five days a week how can i make my car is broken down you guys don't care about that, even though I'm letting you know, hey, listen, I'm not trying to get out of my obligation. I want to do this, but I'm meeting some struggles. There's no type of, uh, there's no room for any, any of real life things that happen. It's just, can you pay? If you can't pay, well, guess what? We will lock you up. We will actually charge you interest <laughs> for, for supporting your children that, mind you, they don't actually get, goes to the state. That's what, you're dealing with it's like it's like this desire not desire but it's almost like you can't i know one of the things that and then i want to hear your take on this faustin i one of the things that i became keenly aware of at a at a pretty young age as an artist as an artist in in new york city was um watch how fast you walk in new york city full, <laughs> full, full disclosure Jaja and I Jesus. have known each other since we were 14 years old, so this is a kind we talk. Right? Right. Um, he knows all my secrets, so you know I'm gonna tell his if he doesn't tell mine. Right? <laughs> so, so, but we went to high school together, so it's a similar story for us in, in a way. Um, but I remember, um, I remember walking down the street one day. I might have been with you, and somebody would you slow down? Because I'm a fast walker. Y'all have seen me, you know. Mm -hmm. I got things to do. Mm -hmm. But there's this way that. It's like, hey, guard your guard how fat guard your gate because um, you don't want to become part of a system and have your name logged into a system and kind of be tracked. Um, so the, the 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 fear of being tracked was something that I kind of grew up with. And um, Faustine, I, I'm not necessarily I, I don't I don't know what your situation is in that way, but I wanted to pose the same question to you about um, just who you are as a as a, as a black man. If this is something that is is part of the signature of your work or your process um or or if it's not and um and if if so how and so art has nothing to do as a uh with race you know a creative individual is creative and you know i come from you know a continent and a country whereby we are all black and so the word black does not even exist, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? And so we are all now hustling or struggling to be the best of ourselves through our own creative medium. And so I come with that same sense into the US. So when I'm making my work, I'm not thinking about me as a black man. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about how can I be the best of myself? and how can I use my work to connect with my own society. Mm -hmm. And that has always been my focus. It's not about me being black. Mm -hmm. Even though I may have faced some type of discriminations, but still it doesn't stop my creativity or how I think about, to, mm -hmm. how, to how I think about connecting with society. Mm -hmm. I, like that, man. That's that's awesome. Like that. Like your answer, because the context, like our context, is completely different. Yeah. Um, altogether. Um, 
in context, it makes, it makes a difference. Um, that's part of the reason why that second panel looks the way that it does. This, the second panel. Um, right The here, one in the middle. The one in the middle. Um, this, this idea of erasure, you know, that um, unfortunately, even though the idea behind family court is supposed to be the, to protect the children, to make sure, regardless of what happens between mom and dad, that we can in some way preserve the integrity of the family in spite of whatever's happened. Um, unfortunately, that's not how it actually works out. That's not how it actually plays out for most families. You know what I mean? Especially in the inner city, um, there's a very big difference between you know being a person of color going to family court and and being a white person um, of means going to family court. Very different um, experiences and what you where you are financially, socioeconomically has everything to do with the manner and the type of justice that you get if you get any justice at all. It absolutely yeah. makes a difference. So good points. Yeah. Uh, so you are you are absolutely right. And you know, the the truth about it is that uh, you are able to use your own creativity to to bring out what you know your experience mm -hmm. and you know and if you had to face any other situation, you would have done the same thing. You still, you know, reflect your experience through your works because that is who you are as a person. Yeah. And it's not necessarily uh, you being uh, a black person. Mm -hmm. It's just you expressing how you feel. Mm -hmm. This is how you feel within yourself. Mm -hmm. And uh, as, you know, artists, that is what we do. We express ourselves. That is the best way. That is the only way we actually live by expressing ourselves. We human, we've all since time immemorial, we've been nomads. We chase after food, and that means that we don't. We have no understanding of boundaries. Boundaries does not exist in the brain of even a child because. Very we chase after food. And so when we cross boundaries, when we go to different places, it's because our brain says that there's food there. Mm -hmm. it's, Resource. No, it doesn't have to do with race. But then as we 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 get to experience different types of, you know, uh difficulties when we get into uh, in the uh, in the society but our creativity still remains the same this is interesting talk to me about and uh, Faustine I've known Faustine I'm gonna look I'm gonna name drop I'm gonna name drop Faustine and Jaja all right I know these two I know that Google them all right all right so Faustine is um <laughs> just Google the brother, because you'll try to find out what he does, and you'll find out he does about 50 different things, right, in terms of art. Like, he's talking about art as a singular thing, um, but if you locked him up in a room with nothing but toothpicks, he's going to make something that's going to be MoMA, MoMA red, all right? Because, but, but, that, but it, what you're speaking of right now, um, this idea that it's something that's at the core of your being, um, I think that really does play into how you see the world. And so now I have to ask you, what is freedom for you as an artist, as a human? I know that freedom is a theme that comes up in your work or the idea, uh, it's the impetus for some things. I'm looking at your things here, at, at, the, your, at your, the objects that you've created, and this is also an opportunity for you to go into a conversation about your materials. I don't know if the word freedom and the way you work are so separate, and I wanted to give you a chance to talk about that. So um, I currently have a showing um, at the uh, Woodstock Academy, and uh, it's titled uh, 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 Artistic uh, Freedom, uh, Journey Through Artistic Freedom. And freedom to me, I was trying to explore freedom, what freedom was. Uh, I was trying to explore freedom through my works. Uh, 
and that was the the uh, hearing that uh, I was expecting a child that made me, you know, open-minded. And I wanted to know what freedom was truly. And I locked myself in my studio using whatever, anything that I found. And then I then let myself lose, not being constrained by what I know already, but trying to let myself lose and playing with those materials. Ordinarily, we are all artists. The way our mind works, we always play with compositions. We always play with colors. From the clothes we wear, from what we think, okay, today I'm wearing a, a white shirt. I'm going to be wearing a black shoe. In the, um, in the uh, bounty uh, multitudes of clothes that you have, you pick a certain color to wear for a certain day. It's because you connect with that color. And so, freedom to me is a process of knowing. And so, when I begin to make my work, I experience freedom. When I begin to draw, I experience freedom. When I begin to do the things that makes me joyful, that is what I call freedom. Freedom is not static. Freedom is continuous. And to me, being is different from thinking. Being is an action word. Mm -hmm. And so freedom is also an action word. You always constantly seek after it. It's never enough. Mm -hmm. So to me, it's the action of experiencing the things that you really enjoy doing. That is freedom to me. Do you want to say? Yeah, that's uh, wow. You said a mouthful, brother. Yeah. Um, but I, I really like I like that the comment that you made about freedom in knowing, right? Um, I feel like something that really changed for me um, with this project. Um, so, you guys know, I actually don't have an art degree. Um, I started college as an illustration major. I went to the University of the Arts for my freshman year. Um, I really hated Philly. Um, I'd only applied to three schools, and, and the one in Philly was the only one that I, that I really wanted to go, go into, right? So I did that for a year. I transferred back to New York, which is where I'm from. Grew up in the Bronx. I transferred back to SBA. Um, enjoyed the school. It was way too expensive, and I remember standing in financial aid one day and just asking the lady, honestly, like, how do people do it like I don't understand like I'm I'm really I don't understand how this happens like you guys the tuition goes up every year <laughs> like, I can't afford this it's like oh they, they just take loans and stuff I'm like oh wow I can't do that so I, I became a business major right um, but one thing that never stopped for me was wanting to learn um, and, and to become better at the craft so um, most of my work, most of what I really, really appreciate and what's really pushed me forward has been the knowledge that I went and I got myself, you know, um, studying art, art history textbooks, studying the, the artists that I really love, John Singer Sargent, you know what I mean? How did Diego Velasquez get, you know, his, his uh, you know, illusions of, of writing on the page when there wasn't any writing there? Stuff like that, stuff that to me at the time was like, wow, this is amazing. I don't know how he did it but I'm gonna study until I can figure it out. I'm gonna to try to reproduce this as best I can. Um, you know, dissecting, you know, the, the, the demo paintings of like a Stephen Assail, who's a guy who, who taught at SVA. He still teaches at SVA as far as I know, but I never got to get into his class because they were always booked out every semester, always packed. Um, but, but just always wanting to know, always wanting to increase my knowledge and understanding of the materials and how people put paintings together. Um, so for me, I found um, having that knowledge really helped me a lot. And, but 
At the same time, um, the training as an illustrator in some ways um, stifled me, I think. And I felt like as I approached this project, this was less about um, the technicalities of what I wanted to depict. I knew I could do the technicalities. This was more about the feeling. And for the feeling, I couldn't have like, you know, 20 thumbnails and five different, you know, studies and still maintain, like it had to be fresh. It had to be, I'm going into it. And I'm gonna figure it out because that's where I am in my life. I don't know what the heck is going on here and I'm gonna have to figure it out. Yeah. So um, there, weren't, there weren't a ton of studies for this. There weren't any sketches. There weren't, there weren't none of that stuff. Uh, I, I think as far as studies go for the border here, where I, I was really kind of in the weeds and I'd never done any of that before, like I did a couple of really quick painted studies, but what you see here is what I worked out on, on the paper itself. It, there, wasn't a, there wasn't a predetermined, this is what it's gonna look like. I figured it out. Very, very good. I know you had something. Yes. And so, um, when we think about materials, uh, medium, there's, we, ought, we obviously know that we can use almost anything. And history has shown that there's, uh, artists have used almost everything to make art. You know, you think about the Nabanjo's art, which is a spiritual art, you know, the sand painting, and, and they were not categorized as art. They were categorizing it as a spiritual performance. But to us, it was art. And you see, materials plays a big role in art. And like, when I started using the aluminum cans, it's because I wanted to know about the American society. In Nigeria, I use sand particles to make art. And the sand is because uh, in Africa, sun has always been a key component of spiritualism. And also, sun has always reflected labor because laborers we queue every morning waiting for a big truck to come pick them up to go on site to build houses. Most of the housing in Nigeria, uh, in, in uh, West Africa, they are built with bricks. And so you understand that the sand was pertaining to the people's lifestyle in that particular society. In France, uh, I use copper wires uh, to make art. And those copper wires, I wanted to create uh, a series of uh, the age of enlightenment. And so I used this, I created this ant with, in different uh, sections with light on it. So from the darkest point to the brightest point. And I wanted to describe the history, the, the French Revolution, and uh, how it, be, it came from a monarchy to a republic. And what was, I was more curious about the mentality that people had from, you know, for the change to happen. And uh, that series was Lash de Lumière uh, that I made. And so, uh, my second series, uh, Transformation series, at that point I was no longer working only solely on aluminum cans, but I also wanted to incorporate different medium to, uh, to the piece. So this is also part of a, a transformation series. That piece right there on the wall is also part of transformation series. This is uh, repetition propaganda. That also is part of a- uh, That's the name of it? Yes. That's a great name. <laughs> wow. So, uh, now, this, most of these works you see here, I was so particular about the materials and how the material has to tell a meaning. And 
the more I was so concentrated on like using, trying to make meaning with materials, I was also framing myself. I wasn't finding freedom. I was trapping myself because I was so fixed in making the materials work in a certain way. But when you are looking for artistic freedom, that means that you're also letting yourself vulnerable yeah. to let the materials just direct yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. And because it's a conversation, it's a three-way conversation when you are making a piece of art. Yeah. The material, yeah. the art itself, and the artist. Yeah. So all these three, the, the conversation needs to be inclined in order to have beautiful pieces like he makes, you know. And so, and also indirect, you automatically have an understanding of composition. You understand, you also have the understanding of balance. You have an understanding of proportion in your works. All those things are just guidance to making a piece of art. Yeah. But making a great piece of art is letting yourself lose. Yeah. Hmm. Can, can I say something? Yeah. I'm the moderator. Can I say something? <laughs> um, I, I, and then, John, I have some questions for you. Um, there's so much that you said, Faustine. There's so much that you said. Yeah, there's so much right. there. Um, you should write a book. Yeah. <laughs> there, you have a, you, uh, a treatise. You have, a, you, have a, you have your own, like, this internal kind of philosophy. Yeah. And it really is evident in your work, wow. but it's so much more evident when you speak yeah. about your work. It's, um, it's really fun wow. to listen to you speak about these works. And um, as you were speaking, I was reminded of one of my heroes in art, Michelangelo. Um, uh, Michelangelo's sculptures, if you, a lot of his sculptures, uh, the ones he liked the most, are the ones that are, they, to anybody else, they look like they're half finished. I think he, that later on in life, he just stopped caring. He's like, he's like look, uh, and, and, and you know, he would, he would tell them, like, the, 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 the wood or the, or, the, or the stone said I should stop. It's just like, there's nothing more to do. And so you have this half of a face with a little bit of an eye and an arm that's not, and he's like, but that's where it, meant, it was meant to stop. And, um, and I just, I'm listening to you and I'm remembering, uh, Faustine came to my studio uh, about a year ago and we just had a great conversation, just having a conversation. And while we were talking, Faustine was doodling on newsprint, which is the lowest form, you know, you know, paid art paper, right? Of course you don't remember. <laughs> the other thing you don't remember, Faustine, is this very elaborate drawing that he did that he's, ne he's never gonna get back because I know what his work goes for. So I'm not, I'm not stupid, <laughs> you know. You know he, but, but, the, the, but the thing is, whenever I see this, this drawing in this, in this newsprint, what that drawing has become is a record of that meeting, right? So it's, it, to anybody else, it's this artwork you could hang up yeah. and, and it, that may happen. But the artwork itself happened so naturally, it happened as naturally as Faustine and I were speaking. Um, it was part of the conversation. And so as you're speaking, I'm like, yep, this is, um, you're living this out and it's just really, really cool to, um, to hear you speak about this this way. Um, I wanted to, Jaja, I wanted to give you a chance to talk about materials because there's a number of things you could say about it and you have yeah. slides that, that are here. And I, I don't want to direct your conversation, but could you give us a little bit of the inner workings of this? I, I, know, I know how you work. Mm -hmm. And Jaja is the kind of artist, you've heard of artists like these. Oh, we've studied some artists like these in our class, artists who will take a year or two or 10 um, to, develop, <laughs> to develop a face. This is my friend Jaja. So, Jaja, explain to them why you've been working on this for three or four or five years, and, um, and, and the layers that, 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 yeah. that are, here you go. Okay, um, so um, this, this actual slide, this is um, this piece right here. Um, so, this is actually Saunders Waterford um, watercolor paper. I bring that up um, because paper became extremely important to me. It's always been important to me, but I feel like it's become even more important to me in the last, you know, eight to 10 years, um, because I have a very specific way of working. Um, and generally speaking, 
Um, when I start a piece, I don't know if I'm gonna, if it's gonna remain dry or if there's gonna be wet stuff. So I just always prepare for anything. So I just, I just assume that if it's dry now, at some point it will be wet. And so the paper needs to accommodate that, which means I need to be working on some type of watercolor paper, right? Because it can stand that. Um, and, and as far as it goes, I don't like 140 pound watercolor paper. Nothing against anybody who does, but I like my paper thick. I like it hardy. Um, I like to scrub, you know, I like to erase, I like to wipe out. And I've experimented with a lot of different papers and Saunders Waterford holds up to the abuse that I give it. And so it's almost exclusively been what I've used for pretty much the last eight years. Um, uh, Twin Walker is another one that's really cool. Um, but so this was the start of this image. Um, the paper itself is white. Uh, I actually tone the paper before I get started. So that's that's part that's a part that you don't actually see in here, but I basically mix in, you know, a red that's specific to, you know, this piece with the gesso and I take a smooth roller, a paint roller and I roll it on. Um, that in and of itself is like a couple of hours of a process because this is actually my my second place. So this is my room. When I first started this, when I started the rolling process, I was in a studio. Uh, like a studio apartment. So very small, very confined spaces. Um, so in, in terms of like the work itself speaking to you, um, life circumstances, I would love to have work larger, but my physical space did not allow for that. And so part of what you see here is a result of me working within the confines of what I have. I work in a studio apartment, so what I need, what I work, what I do needs to fit where I am, right? So uh, when I started this, I rolled it on, and it was just very gestural um, and very, just very much like how I felt at the time, what I felt it should be, uh, which, you know, is a big deal for me because like I said, you know, normally there are thumbnails and there are studies and there's all kinds of stuff. And this time around, there was none of that, you know, so this was like just figuring it out, you know, as I went along. So um, there's that. There's also an element of the process that is actually not represented here, but if you get if you get close enough. Let me see if I can. Oh, okay, okay. Oops. Sorry, guys. Um, so there's an element of the process that that is not like kind of uh, visible in the slides, but um, during this this whole process of making the the images. Oh, thank you. Um, I discovered. Um, I, I learned about. Um, the Japanese printmaking process of suminagashi, where you're, you're basically um, lifting prints off of water, you drop ink onto the, the surface of the water, um, you create patterns with it, and then you lay the paper down. Um, and for me, um, like I was just, I was working through a visual problem, I was on YouTube, I came across a, a video of it, and I was like, oh wow, that, that's really cool, I think that would actually work for what I'm trying to do. Um, and so I began the process of learning how to do that. Um, could, could you only because only only because we're going to lose them in terms of the timing? Um, yes. Because I want them to be able to ask some questions. Mm -hmm. Could you get us to where you're dealing with the images and the layers and the colors? Yes. Because okay. because the the process of the staining it will, it's going to take too long. Um, if, you, if we can find that image, uh, <laughs> all right. I'm going to look for that. There one. it is. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. 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 So. We'll put that on pause. This this is actually, that's actually the finished one. There's another one that's even before. Yes, that one. Okay, so when this when this image started, it was just the it was just a pencil drawing, right? So I laid it in and I started building it up uh, with the tone, so with, with the pencil itself, but then going through this kind of um, white phase, we'll call it, right? Where I actually lay down thin layers, thin veils of like uh, titanium white, which is basically what I use, like acrylic. This is acrylic um, paint. Um, again, like within the confines of, of my, my living space and financially what I have acrylic works really well for me. Doesn't require a lot of solvents, doesn't require a lot of setup or cleanup, very easy to use. So acrylic it was. Um, so basically I laid the white down to kind of build up the, this idea of light, right? Which I will then go over um, in the succeeding layers with um, thin layers of color, which then give you like this kind of, again, this sense of light and the sense that it's kind of glowing and illuminated from within. Um, but it's not something that you can do 
um, with like a layer or two. It requires a number of layers to really get that to get that feeling. May I ask you a question? Mm -hmm. So in terms of like your use of layers, because I'm, in terms of your use of layers, what is it that, what is the, in, what is the, in, mm, sorry, what is the, uh, my students are used to be blanking out like this, they help me sometimes, mm -hmm. sometimes. Um, what is the philosophy that you're, what are you learning? If, 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 um, if freedom is, is, is a process of knowing and learning, what exactly is that process of layering doing for so, you? I think because I think that might be what's more pertinent. Everyone here isn't an art student. Yeah. Um. But but they they may understand the un, what's happening for you while yeah. you're doing that. I think for personally for me, um, so the layering of the color and the paint, um, it deals with light. This aspect of light, um, and you know, there's a reason why interior designers, generally speaking. Um, lay out their rooms in very bright colors and not dark colors, right? Because bright colors make it feel larger. It makes it feel airy. It makes it feel welcome. And darker colors tend to shrink a space. Um, and, and within the context of discussion here, this idea of freedom has everything to do with light and spirituality for me. Um, you know, I'm a follower of Christ. And for me, um, that, that had everything to do with how and why these, these these images were constructed. Um, and so this idea of, of something being lit or being darkened or fading has everything to do with the experience itself and how it feels in the experience, how it feels to be shrunken down, how it feels to be erased, mm -hmm. you know what I mean, um, from, from my kids' lives, you know what I mean? Legally, legally, but, but erased mm -hmm. um, for all intents and purposes. Um, and so that, that was a huge part of how and why I used light the way that I did. Very well said. I wonder for, and, and this will be my, my last big question. Do some of you all have questions? I'm wondering, are there, I just want to see a, a raise of hands. There are some questions, good. Um, I wanted to give you all a chance to ask some questions. That's why I'm, I'm beginning to bring this into a, some kind of a close. I, I have a question about I have a question about um, Homeland. Did I write down here? Homeland, um, nationhood, and belonging. And um, and I think that I think that both of you have reflected on these things to some degree here 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 or there. But I I, I wanted to know what what your thoughts are about about those things and. and I ask that as somebody who um, who comes from this, I, I see the world in, in, in twos constantly. Like I, I was American, I'm American born, my family is from Nigeria. I don't speak the language, but I'm very connected to the culture. My name suggests I'm not. I'm not American, as they would say, right? Um, when I when my name comes up in an email, I tell them, please don't delete it. It's not a computer virus. It's it's just me, you know. So you know, so my name suggests that I'm I'm outside, right? Yeah. And um, and then there are all these other things that are complicated, that are more complex within that. And I wonder how you all think about the ideas of homeland, citizenship, belonging. Um, and nationhood um, as people or in your work? So, you don't choose where you're going to be born. And so that is not your choice. You know, by birth, you're just born. <laughs> your parents choose, right? Yeah. And so with that, you know, when it comes to homeland, where you're born, you might call it a homeland because that's where you're being given birth to. But belonging, uh, and where? Belonging. belonging. Yeah, there were a whole bunch of them. Um, homeland, homeland you nationhood, said. nationhood, belonging. Okay, yes. So nationhood, birth is nationhood. Homeland is where you grew up and then you choose to where you want to settle in life mm -hmm. as an individual. Mm -hmm. And then you choose that place as your home, right? Mm -hmm. And so 
belonging is now needs to happen with family, right? Now, I, Nigeria, I leave Nigeria, I come to the US. Nigeria is my nation, nationhood. I come to the US and now society forms me to be American, yet not forgotten where I come from, right? And so my ancestral cords still exist within me while now I consider myself an American because society shaped me to be an American. Now I find a wife, get, and then have children. Those are my belongings in my own homeland. That is the way I understand it. As I said, we human, we do not understand what boundaries is. It's, if we are not made for that, you know, majority of you must have studied prehistory uh, time before writing. Uh, it's written that men were nomads, right? We chase after food. And so, if we are nomads, and that is what history says, and we are always moving from one place to another, that means that where we settle in, that is where is our homeland for that moment. So it's not fixed. It's not, it's not fixed. So citizenship and all of that has to come with law and structure. But if without that, like citizenship and all of that, those are documents, those are the laws put in place just to create restrictions. But the human brain is, doesn't have that. Okay, so in, in, in your, now, I, do, I will say this. I, I, have, I have my feelings about homeland, and, um, and I, I, I always wonder, like I, I, as much as I am American, as little, the little time I've spent in Nigeria, I still feel somewhere in my heart Nigeria is my home. And it's, um, it's, uh, it's uh, I don't know if that's my Americanness saying I can just decide, you know, because there is this way that, you know, when you're raised here, well, you know, you know, do you know who I am? You go to the airport and we're the ones, like, they, they know those are the Americans there. They, they want their cheeseburgers now, right? Yeah. So there's a way that we're raised to like, you know, we can d decide, we can name something and it becomes it. Um, but there's this way that I feel that, uh, in my heart, it's Nigeria is still the homeland, even though I, I don't reside there, and I don't know if I ever want to reside there. It's just I'm just. It's, I don't know if there's a there is no fixed answer. I, I, it's perspective. Yeah, yeah. Judge, I wanted you to have a chance to um, to answer this, and then the final thing I want to happen. A question and answer is going to be real short. Um, any advice that you all have for these students before they leave this room? It doesn't have to be art based. Just their students. You're not anymore. Um, and just by virtue of how long you've been on the earth, you know more than they do. So, um, so they should listen to anything you have, anything you have to say. So that's, that's coming, but if, if you have anything to say about homeland and that yeah. aspect, yeah. Uh, please um, ask questions, yeah. ask questions. They want to, we're not giving them a chance. Is that, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I don't know, I mean, I, I'm American. Um, my name, it's kind of interesting. So Imar is American, but of Nigerian descent. My name is Nigerian, but my parents are not from Nigeria, never been to Nigeria, probably will never go to Nigeria. So it's kind of interesting you talk about, you know, um, homeland, this idea of nationhood. Um, you know, it, there in some ways, I, I wish I could say, you know what I mean, like I had a homeland, you know. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm American, but in a lot of ways I feel alien mm -hmm. in this country. You know what I mean? Like, because I can't just take a walk around the block with my wife. You know, Christina sitting here in the back. This is my second wife. We can't just go around the block without me thinking I, I need to have my ID on me because what if a cop pulls us over and I don't have my ID and now they want to lock me up because I don't have ID. See, maybe not everybody thinks about that before they go outside, but that's something I have to think about because I've seen it happen. You know, I, I went to visit my, my friend uh, one time, Bernard, you know, in Harlem. 
And I was just coming by to, to see him. Apparently, some kind of situation had happened on the street. Cops were questioning people, and they started looking at me. I'm like, I don't know anything, and let me get the hell out of here before they start thinking I know something, and that and now I'm being detained, and I don't even know what's going on. I was just, I just happened to be here. Um, this idea, in the sense that even though I'm an American and I have I have my papers, you know, um, at any point I can be detained. I can be stopped, even if I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Um, and there's not a whole hell of a lot that I can do about it. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I identify as American. I lived overseas for about 10 years of my life. Uh, and so I'm definitely American, but then there's a sense that um, I don't fully belong here. I don't really fully feel like I belong. Because in order to talk about belonging, you have to deal with acceptance, right? You don't have belonging without acceptance. That means I embrace who you are, not, like as long as you conform to what I want you to be, then I then I embrace you. No, like I like I accept you as you are, right? Um, and that's something that I mean everybody's looking for. You know, whether you're talking about family or you're talking about you know neighborhood or community or whatever, or on some level or other, many of the issues that we have as a society deal with this idea of being accepted or not feeling accepted and what people do mm -hmm. because they feel like they're not accepted. Well, if you won't take me here, then I'm gonna go over here and I'm gonna do this. Somebody's gonna see me, somebody's gonna pay attention. You can't just, right. you know, whatever. Right. That's right. not gonna work. Right. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. thing to say. Oh, oh, very quick, yes. Yes, uh, just one quick uh, thing to say. You know, among animals, right, even lions, when they see a different a tribe of lion coming, they attack that lion, right? It's because even animals, they have tribes, and they are all. It's always a threat, even within animals, to see another tribe coming. It's a threat. Mm -hmm. It's the same way too with us humans. Same likeness but because this person is different color from where from me is already a threat and so then it it invokes something mm -hmm. and you know so I think the natural instinct of man when you see something different first of all is taking precaution and first before you attack and so this is something that we are bound to see like and this is something that has been happening since time immemorial so it will never stop mm -hmm. even tomorrow if this whole world vanishes and then there's a new we all go people in in in, uh, in jupiter we say that these people are different from us and then it's still going to be uh, yeah. a different uh no discrimination so it's something that is constant right now how do we deal with this thing is the bigger question thank you so much Faustine. thank you so much jaja for being a part of this um this has been enlightening um and i'm glad i'm glad that this will kind of live on um beyond um the conversation in the room here for people to be able to to view and consume and take a part um later on so thank you so much for this everybody thank you.